All right, we have made it to chapter 14. Chapter 14 is going to be about vector value functions. So this first video, we're going to look at curves in space. I'm going to show you a couple of um, graphs that I've made on a 3D grapher. Um, here's the link to the 3D grapher. Right here, if you click on the blank notes, there should be a clickable link. Um, but also, if you look up uh, Monroe Community College 3D grapher, you can find it um, from Google. It's a really cool 3D grapher, so we'll be using that quite a bit. All right, so first off, our definition for a vector valued function. So this is a function in the form of v of t, where v is a vector, and our vector is equal to h of t, g of t, and a, ah, h of t, f of t, g of t, h of t, there we go. I can speak today. And this is our vector value function. So we've seen things like this before. We'll show one here in a really quick minute. But our components of our vector are going to be functions. So how this is going to work, when we plug in a value for t, that's going to give us a position vector. And this function is kind of going to give us our trajectory that we're going on. So this is a picture here from our textbook. And what it's telling us that at various times for t, so maybe this is t is equal to negative 2, and maybe this is t is equal to 1, maybe this is t is equal to 1.5, maybe this is t is equal to 2, maybe over here this is t equal to 4, so that our points are going to follow along this path and each time we plug in a value for t, and you can think of that as a time, it's going to tell us where we are on this curve. So one way to think about these curves is that they're kind of like a piece of wire that's sitting in space that we've bent or turned into a spiral or done different things to, and it's just sitting in space. So we absolutely have looked at vector value functions already. It's exactly what we were doing when we were looking at lines in space. These were vector valued functions. So when we had, like this example says, okay, a vector value function for, for the line, um, through these two points, we find the vector that goes between those two points because that gives us our direction. Oops, we're not using 7 yet. 4 minus 1, 1 minus negative 1, 7 minus 2. So the direction that this line is moving in is uh, in the direction of the vector 3, 2, 5. And we can take either one of our two points on our line. It really doesn't matter because that just gives you kind of a starting point for where you find your other points from. So we'll call this one L of t, because just like any kind of function, you can give it any name that you want. Um, we'll see R a lot. That's just what's used you know, often. Um, we use L sometimes when it's a line. But we have that position vector of one of our two points. Again, it does not matter which one, plus t times that direction vector. And so, Another way that we could write this, so we've seen this before, but we could write this as 1 plus 3t as the x component, negative 1 plus 2t as the y component, and 2 plus 5t as our z component. And this really is similar to those parametric equations that we can have for this. And we're going to look at the parametric equations with these vector value functions a lot because it's, it's nice to break them down and think about them that way um, as well. So we've seen these before, we've done these, now we're just going to be dealing with, you know, not having linear things necessarily as our vectors. So again, just to think about how this is working is, say for example, we've got some sort of vector valued function that when we plug in values for t, again, and again, it's nice to think about that as time, we're going to get these position vectors that are going to squirrel us all around in three space. So like, for example, here, maybe t is equal to a, we get that point and as we, and then it has a direction. So as t gets bigger, maybe here's b over here, and then maybe t is equal to c is over here. And so there's a directionality to this and it's like the trajectory and so one of the ways that you can think about this, and one of the things that we do with vector value fun functions, is to think about movement of a particle. Um, instead of it necessarily being like a solid thing, it's how something is moving through space. Um, we could have a spot 
right here where the trajectories could intersect. Now this spot here, this would be t equaling say time sub one and t equaling time sub two, but it's not necessarily that those two times are equal and they actually are not. So, but it's two times maybe that it's in the same space, but maybe that's not, maybe that's just the view that we've got, but it could be that, that they do, it does cross itself and um, our particles in the same place at two separate times. Okay, so let's think about how these look and looking at the graphs of these. Um, so we're gonna take a look, a look at the graph of R of T, and I want that to be R of T. R of T is equal to cosine, uh, sine, cosine of T, sine of T, and T. So one of the things that we do when we look at these is to actually just think about, okay, what if we're gonna look at this from the top down, so sort of looking from above, and that's going to be this xy plane. So this is if we've taken, you know, the z plane and made it go straight up and down so we can't even see it, or the z axis, and so we're looking just straight down onto that xy plane. So this can start to give us an idea of what it's going to look like in three dimensions if we can kind of figure out at least what this two-dimensional part of it is. So our parametric equations are x is equal to cosine of t, y is equal to sine of t, and z is equal to t. So we're not going to worry about the z is equal to t right now at this moment. We'll worry about it in a second. Um, I just want to look at these first two right here and say, okay, what's happening with those? And something that I left off of here that we see a lot in our textbook is we'll say that we're going to look at t being from say 0 to 2 pi but it could be from negative infinity to infinity it could be um, it could be any sorts of things but we we often look at 0 to 2 pi because a lot of times we deal with sine and cosine with these um, so that's why you often see 0 to 2 pi because it repeats itself I don't think I needed to whisper that <laughs> um, so something we know about cosine squared of t and sine squared of t, so that's equal to 1, right? That's true. That's one of our trig identities. And we could replace that cosine of t with x, because cosine of t is x. That's how we're defined here. And uh, sine of t, we could replace that with y. And so what's also going to be true for this equation, for this graph here, is that x squared plus y squared is going to be equal to 1. Well, if it's been a little while since you've seen this, this is a circle that has a center at 0, 0, and it has radius square to 1, which is 1. So as t increases, as it goes from 0 to 2 pi, our graph actually is going to start right there at negative, or not at negative 1. It's going to start at 1, 0, and it's going to move around in a circular pattern, you know, it's going to go 0, 1 there. There's our negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. So it's going to move around. At least just the x and the y values are going to move around in a circle like that. Again, you guys can see my bad drawing. Um, so going around in a circle like that. Now, thinking about now what's going to happen in three dimensions is that when we plug in values for t, we're going to plug in, you know, 0 to 2 pi for that z component as well. So what it's going to do is it's going to start right here at 1, 0, 0, and it's going to go around in a circle, but it's also going to go up. The z values are going to get higher and higher because, say, when we're here, which, oh goodness, where is that going to be exactly? <laughs> Maybe it'd be something like uh, 3 pi over 4. All right, we get cosine of 3 pi over 4, sine of 3 pi over 4, and then 3 pi over 4 is the z component. So let's take a little bit better picture of this. This is where I'm going to grab that 3D grapher. And I already have it set up here. Oh, it got real big. And it got a little upside down. So one of the cool things you can do with this is you can grab the corners of this box here and move things around. There we go. That's almost exactly how I want it to look. So 
on this, there is a little blue vector there and it's sitting at that starting point. So it's sitting at that X being one, Y being zero and Z being zero because it's starting with T being zero. And I actually graph this from zero to four pi. So we have a little bit of a bigger picture. And then I'm going to animate this. So what this is going to do is it's going to move that vector. It's going to um, change our values of T. So ooh, look at it go here. Let's stop it for a second. I can actually slow it down if I make it have more steps. Okay, so let's do that. There we go. Now it's a little bit slower. We can see it. So, so what this is doing is it's plugging in different values of T and it's showing us where that position vector is going to go based on those different values of T. Now I absolutely could make this go from negative two pi. There we go to four pi. And now it's going to go down below that X, Y plane, but the whole time it's still just going to be the spiral. It's just going to be doing circle after circle, but spiraling up as we go, because those Z values are getting bigger and bigger as we go higher and higher. So hopefully that picture makes sense. And so this is that idea of our picture, our graph is this, is this spiral. It's like a wire sitting out in space. Oops, there we go. Nope, that's not where we want to go. Let's go back here. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Oh, it, this is actually, this does have a key. Probably heard it before, this is a helix. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So this one's fairly similar, a little bit different, but again, it's, it's good to sort of start by that top-down view and thinking, okay, let's not worry about what's happening with the up and down. Let's take a look at what's happening um, just in the XY plane and say, okay, so we've got, x is equal to 1 plus cosine of t and y is equal to sine of t and then over here we'll deal with that z being sine of 5t here in a second but that's going to be a little bit different than what we were dealing with before so here this still actually is going to be a circle and what we can do is take this one here and subtract one from both sides so we still can use that trig identity that, oops, I wanted to write cosine first. Cosine squared of t plus sine squared of t is equal to one, because again, that's something we know is true. So in the case of this graph, here now, cosine, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Cosine of t is equal to one minus x instead of just regular x like we had last time. So this is gonna be one minus x squared. Sine of t is still just plain old y. And then this is equal to one. So what this, how this is different now is this is still a circle and it still has radius square to one, it's equal to one in the, um, if it's been a little while since you've looked at, uh, the equation of a circle, and it may be. The equation of a circle is x minus x1 squared plus y minus y1 squared equals r squared, and then the center is at x1, y1, and then the radius is r. Ooh, what does that actually look like an r? That's why I keep writing square to one. And so this one, it has a center at one zero. So we've moved over the center here. Here, we'll maybe make that one zero. We'll change this up a little bit. So that's where our center is gonna be. So that's just gonna take that circle that we had before and move it out here to two, two zero, and that's gonna be zero zero. That's, this is now going to be one one, and this is going to be one negative one. And we're going to go around the circle the same way. It's still going to start in the same place. And that's going to be our direction. So this is still going to go in a circle. But now we need to think about what's happening to that, those, those Z variables. So we've got sine of 5T. So what that's going to do is that's going to be lumpy bumpy kind of like that. So what's going to happen and I don't know if you even want me to draw this, but I'll do kind of do my best here, is it's going to go around in a circle and it's going to be wavy like this. 
Ooh, that's a terrible drawing. <laughs> it's going to be kind of a wavy circle. It's going to go up and down. So let's take a look. I do have this drawn in the 3D grapher. Let's make, ooh, move the corner there so we can see it. Okay, there's the x-axis. So we can see that that circle is kind of now moved so that the center is here at 1, 0. And if I hit animate on this one, we can see what's happening with those position vectors as we go around, that it's going up and down with our sine function and still going in the circle in terms of the x and the y. So that's why it's kind of nice to start with that sort of thinking about what it's going to look like in two dimensions and then saying, okay, then if we layer on what's happening with the up and the down, then we can figure out what this thing is going to look like. Woo. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> Just trying to get that to pop up there because we have one more thing that we need to talk about in this section and that's with limits of vector valued functions. Now the nice thing about this is all the laws of limits that you ever learned in 251, they all still work here. Nothing has changed. Uh, to find the limit of a vector value function, you just find the limit of each of the components. So if we've got some sort of vector value function, r of t, and we want the limit as t goes to a, all we need to do is find the limit of each piece. So how we see it in the textbook a lot, it looks like this, um, where you've got it written in its component parts here. So you've got 4t minus 5i, e to the t minus 1 over 2tj, and cosine of t k. So again, this is that x component. Oops. This is our y component, and then there's our z component. And the i, j, and k, that is just the regular old i, j, and k that we have with vectors, so that's not actually part of our function. So what we need to do is figure out the limit of each of the pieces. We need to figure out what is the limit as t goes to 0 of 4t minus 5, so without the i there. And this is one that we can do direct substitution on, because there's nothing weird with like 0 over 0 or anything like that, so we get negative 5. So it's going to be negative 5i. And so that i still just is there. Let's just get our arrow over it. Then we also need to do the limit as t goes to 0. Let's skip to the cosine one, because that's pretty easy. That's another one that we can do with direct substitution. We can just plug in 0 for cosine, and we get 1. Um, so we're going to get 1 times k. So cool, we can do that. And our one in the middle there, the limit as t goes to 0 of uh, e to the t minus 1 over 2t. If you try to do direct substitution, we are going to get 0 over 0, which is one of those indeterminate forms. And this is one that we can use L'Hopital's rule on. So we get the limit as t goes to 0, uh, derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom. So we get e to the t on the top and 2 on the bottom. Now we can use direct substitution to get e to the 0 over 2. And so that's 1 half. So we get 1 half j. So just the limit of each of the individual components, so it's going to be a little bit of a review of finding limits.